Uh, welcome everybody and uh, my particular thanks to Deputy Gorkin Kennedy for kindly agreeing to launch our report today and for her very generous words and, uh, and insights uh, which I think are particularly interesting in, in terms of giving an insight into the, the process of the Justice uh, Committee uh, which have been so recent. Um, so it's wonderful to see such a great crowd here and uh, to engage on this very important issue um, of support to those affected by prostitution and sex trafficking in Ireland, which is our primary focus today. Uh, I'm really delighted to be sharing the panel with some uh, excellent speakers, and whom I'd really like to personally thank for being here today, and also Catherine Joyce uh, Bernardo's uh, also a board member, for, for chairing our session. Um, I hope that everybody finds something of interest, uh, something thought-provoking, and also in the questions and answers session later, I have an opportunity to share your own learning and experiences on this issue because something I'll be highlighting is the fact that this isn't a single organisation operation. It is very much a, an all society and interagency um, uh, uh, response that's required to this particular issue. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is give a brief overview of uh, our annual report for 2012. I'm not going to delve unduly into the graphs and charts because I hope you all do have a copy that you can take away um, and uh, examine at your leisure. It'll also be up on, on the web and available on PDF uh, for people to share, as uh, Deputy Corcoran Kennedy has uh, suggested, which is a great suggestion. Um, and uh, what I'll also do is, is try and give an overview of the, the kind of context of the, the uh, operations for the year, the, the way that the sex trade is, um, is operating in Ireland and some of the particular trends and experiences that uh, women who have come in contact with our service have highlighted to us and our workers have highlighted to us in the course of the year. Um, so, sorry, this is, can you still hear me if I put that down like that? No. <laughs> it's right in my eye line. <laughs> Um, so, uh, for those of us who are not perhaps, oh, work's going up and down as well, <laughs> uh, who are not perhaps uh, familiar with Rahama as an organisation, just a few words by way of introduction. Um, the organisation has been in existence now for 24 years. Um, we are dedicated service specifically to, to supporting women affected by prostitution uh, and our client group includes women who are still um, currently involved in prostitution, so actively involved on street and indoors, women who are exiting prostitution, uh, those who have a past experience because our experience is that sometimes the legacy of, of being in prostitution can uh, come back um, and people can identify that they require support even after a period of having exited. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation, um, just to acknowledge that there are obviously other forms of trafficking, labour exploitation, domestic servitude and removal of organs, but our particular focus is in relation to sex uh, trafficking. And so when I talk about trafficking, it's that particular form that I'm, I'm speaking about. Um, our particular mission is threefold, uh, to provide support services uh, to women, um, to offer assistance um, to explore alternatives to prostitution, so the two are not mutually exclusive as I'll, I'll highlight later and I think uh, Ruth who's going to be presenting the, the, the actual groundbreaking research in this area will, will highlight as well. Um, and then also a key part of our work is around um, advocacy awareness raising uh, to change public attitudes, uh, practices and policies in relation to prostitution and trafficking. So I don't know where to put my spare pages. Okay, so this is a little visual, <laughs> just rather than giving you a list of things. What we offer is a holistic and um, person-centered service, which is non-judgmental and responds to women's needs. Um, and that ranges from practical supports, educational, uh, career planning, but also crisis intervention and crisis and emergency situations, support with immigration, health issues, family, housing, and uh, legal supports as well. Uh, our experience is that women affected by prostitution and trafficking engage with Ruhama for a broad variety of supports and services. Um, some are very big and complex, and some are quite small and simple uh, and practical. So in the course of working collaboratively, what we tend to share is not just the serious challenges, but also, very critically, the hopes and the dreams and the plans and the successes of women um, as they're on their journey. Um, Dr. Pillinger is going to be highlighting in a bit more detail Ruhama's uh, specific model of work um, when she's presenting her evaluation uh, of uh, the service with our service users, so I'm not going to go into very significant detail on that point. Um, but just to give you perhaps a sense of our work in 2011 to highlight um, 
We do continue to operate um, in a very challenging funding climate and so despite in 2012 having had to reduce our capacity uh, in terms of casework hours due to funding cuts, Rahamat nonetheless responded to a record 258 women in 2012. So our in-depth advocacy and support service offered through casework and development uh, responded <coughs> Uh, with uh, 908 face-to-face -face contacts with 170 women, uh, over 13,000 phone calls, 5,200 text supports, and in addition, Rahama's outreach van, uh, which engages with women in street prostitution, went out on 108 occasions uh, for over 413 hours and engaged with 62 women exclusively in that context on the streets. Um, and in addition, there were 26 women who we did assist um, with initial support, uh, but then to access other appropriate support services, uh, follow-on services, or who chose not to engage in a more intensive casework support. Uh, just to acknowledge before I continue that while the vast majority of those in prostitution are women and girls, there are also a small number of men and a significant minority of transgender persons who are also in the sex trade in Ireland. So Ruhama offers support to any person identifying as a female gender, so we also support trans uh, women. Um, while our comprehensive services don't uh, extend to men, we do always attend to any person's presenting needs and we will always endeavour to identify um, appropriate support services for them depending on what their priority needs are. Okay, so while Ruhama continued to work with a significant number of Irish women, the majority of those in the indoor sex trade in particular are migrant women and this is reflected by the fact in 2012 we worked with women from 32 different nationalities. Um, so this small island, it really highlights, remains a destination for traffickers, pimps and procurers from all corners of the globe. The experiences that women reported in 2012 unfortunately echo those reported nearly every year uh, for the last 24 years of Rohama's existence as a frontline service and they attest to a fundamental harm and some devastating consequences for both the mental and physical well-being of women who become involved in the commercial sex trade. Uh, no parent does think of prostitution as a viable choice for their child, and yet there are women and girls who are bought and sold uh, for the sexual satisfaction of a minority of Irish men in every corner of Ireland. And it is highly important that as a society we take responsibility for this exploitation happening on our own doorsteps. I'll just give you an overview of the reported experiences from our direct work in relation to both on and off street prostitution, which informs our broader advocacy and awareness raising work on the issue of prostitution and trafficking. Uh, while the majority of women accessing our service are involved in the indoor sex trade, there is nonetheless a cohort who are exclusively in street prostitution um, to whom Rahama offers outreach support. And uh, the Rahama team comprises 30 outreach workers who are both volunteers and staff. Um, and in 2012, they met with 72 women on the streets of Dublin, uh, often on multiple occasions um, throughout the year. And 10 of these women did go on to engage with um, the intensive casework service as well during that time. Uh, the street outreach program uses a purposely adapted vehicle, uh, it's a Ford Transit, <laughs> um, but that women can sit into the back of um, and it provides a safe space for women on the streets and in that space we provide a range of practical supports, personal alarms, uh, information to maximise health, personal safety, staff provide appropriate interventions in some cases to assist uh, suicidal uh, women when they engage. And the team also advises women of the casework service uh, with direct information, can refer into the service, and also refer on to other organisations uh, that might be appropriate in the circumstances like health, violence against women services, homeless and housing services, and drug services, should any of those needs be identified. The issues uh, for the women on the street uh, will vary, but there are some common presenting issues, um, though I should stress that not all women will experience all of these, but I suppose to the fore would be addiction, debt, homelessness, uh, or risk of homelessness, uh, supporting a partner financially, including supporting a partner's drug habit, um, poor health, suicidal ideation, um, experiences of serious violence, um, both in the context of their prostitution, but also in other social environments as well. Um, the way we meet women uh, on the street um, 
their circumstances can vary from night to night and so we will meet women uh, wherever they're at at that particular point in time um, and so this can range from women who feel motivated towards some kind of change uh, to women in a media crisis to those who just need a listening ear and don't want to in, or even those who just don't want to engage past getting a hot drink um, something hot to eat and just a temporary respite from the street so it's entirely open to how somebody wants to engage with the service um, we also collaborate with women in street prostitution and other outreach services, uh, specifically the HSE Women's Health Service and the Chrysalis Drugs Project and the Gardaí, to share information relating to dangerous offenders, who unfortunately are very real and present on the street, uh, who are targeting women. And this mechanism of reporting is very helpful because it allows women to give information without requiring that they're making a formal complaint um, if they don't want to. We will support them if they do wish to. Uh, reports then are shared both with other women on the street um, to inform them of potential risks and then also with the Gardaí to support intelligence gathering or investigations that are aimed at apprehending uh, these violent offenders. So while street prostitution uh, definitely does persist and our outreach service is a critical branch of our work. The reality is most women in prostitution are situated indoors um, and the majority will be connected with a pimp. Um, most are also migrant women as uh, highlighted from my map um, and it is commonly understood and accepted that there are approximately 800 to 1,000 women in indoor prostitution in Ireland at any given time. Um, this also was borne out by the uh, 2009 published research by the uh, Immigrant Council which was done in collaboration with the Women's Health Service and uh, Andrew Hama. So women in this indoor sector, uh, sector uh, actually tend to be more controlled and more restricted in their movements than those uh, on street and they will in some cases be very dependent on pimps or traffickers having little or no knowledge of the country, uh, no social support networks and often no English language skills. So while a small number in indoor prostitution are not directly connected with pimps and traffickers, the reality is that they do number a minority. Um, and it is also important to note that every person in prostitution, whether trafficked or pimped or otherwise, is nonetheless vulnerable to the fundamental dangers and the negative health consequences that are intrinsic to just being in prostitution. Uh, there's a commonly expressed view that being in street prostitution is more dangerous than indoors. However, this isn't necessarily the reality. The experience of women in indoor prostitution is no less dangerous, uh, and it also has added complications that women have to cope with, um, and which has significant consequences for both their physical and, emotionally well, uh, and emotional well-being. Um, just to give you an example, based on what, what we hear from women themselves, is feeling a state of constant tension due to the risk of something going wrong. So not just the actuality of something going wrong, but just the perpetual risk that something could go wrong. So this could be, for instance, a buyer pushing for a sex act that they don't wish to engage in, uh, through to a direct attack and assault. Um, another contributor to stress and tension, particularly for Irish women, is the possibility that a person they know, or even a male family member, might actually be on the other side of the door when they open it as a buyer. Um, women have reported being raped, robbed, physically assaulted, and even in cases where there was more than one person on the premises, attacks happening behind closed bedroom doors generally can't be heard, um, and usually assistance and intervention hasn't been possible. Um, the reality is a large number of organised gangs of very, very broadly ranging nationalities effectively control the indoor sex trade, and these are dangerous individuals, and uh, women, particularly vulnerable migrant women who are effectively isolated, uh, are very fearful of reporting abuses by pimps to the Gardaí. Um, in some cases, women uh, are reporting having problems with organised criminals who are either attempting to drive them away from particular areas uh, where they're operating or trying to co coerce them into um, being pimped by them. Uh, another critical difference between on-street and indoor prostitution is that indoors men pay for sex generally between a half hour to sometimes several hours to sometimes to a whole night, um, which requires women to put on a persona of somebody who finds the buyer interesting, attractive and agreeable no matter what they're like. Um, it also requires the woman to take on the persona of their own as the particular escort that the man is expecting her to be. Um, women will rarely, if ever, reveal personal details of themselves, their lives, um, and this can result in what's known as splitting or dissociation and can have significant negative health consequences um, at an emotional level as time goes on. 
Uh, women also in on-street prostitution talk about being able to keep their clothes on and it being a very relatively quick uh, engagement with buyer they, uh, buyers. They'll rarely kiss men and they usually only engage in what are referred to as straight sex acts, whereas for women indoors they have to entertain buyers for longer periods of time and in a far more exposed manner, fulfilling demands for almost any sex act uh, and often very rough sex. Um, while I would stress that it is absolutely not credible to hold women who may be assaulted responsible for the actions of perpetrators by suggesting that they can somehow detect when somebody is going to be violent, there are nonetheless some techniques that women can use uh, to make a very basic risk assessment of a buyer. Um, for instance, if he appears under the influence of drugs or alcohol, if he seems particularly agitated, aggressive or even too quiet, uh, that can make a woman more vigilant. Uh, women uh, on street talk about being able to lean into cars, for instance, to smell the breath of a man to see if he's intoxicated or to see if there's anything on the car seats that might pose a threat. Um, and they also note their belief that it's easier to call attention in a street situation than to try to get out of a locked room or locked apartment. For women indoors, and particularly those who are with pimps um, or traffickers, they have no opportunity to even speak to the buyers for more than a moment before they have to have sex with them. And so there is no meaningful way to actually assess a potential threat in that situation. Um, the other critical thing is that victims of trafficking are predominantly exploited within the confines of the indoor sex trade. And while uh, those organizing uh, are traditionally and increasingly uh, using mobile phone and internet technology in order to run operations while remaining at arm's length, and uh, that makes them very hard to detect. As Deputy Corkin Kennedy has already mentioned, there is an inextricable link between sex trafficking and prostitution. Uh, sex trafficking occurs because of the existence of organised prostitution. Uh, they happen in the same place. Victims of trafficking are advertised on the same website uh, as those otherwise in prostitution. And indeed, in a number of cases, we have encountered uh, situations where the pimp and the trafficker are one and the same person. Um, they have been... Um, uh, there have been individuals who are clear victims of trafficking in the same brothels with women who might not fall into that narrow category. Um, the same individuals, therefore, are pimping one group and trafficking the other because at the end of the day, it all comes down to profit. And the source and provenance of uh, the women and girls is of less interest. So, as I mentioned earlier, collaborative working is absolutely critical and it's always been a key component of Rahama's work both at the front line and in our advocacy work. This is especially important given the highly diverse and complex needs that women affected by prostitution and trafficking present with. Uh, positive working relationships with Gardaí, HSC services, housing, legal, migrant support agencies, charities, addiction services and many more, both in Ireland and overseas, uh, make it possible for Rahama to offer creative advocacy and support to women using our services. And so I would like to express our particular thanks to everybody whom we've worked with in 2012 and continue to work with uh, in 2013 and into the future. Um, we're looking forward to a continuing partnership at a time where, let's face it, collective and joined up responses are more than ever important, um, not just to make sure that we all use our resources to the best effect, but most particularly to try and prevent highly vulnerable women from slipping through the cracks um, in our social system. Um, while all of these collaborations are really important, I'm going to highlight two particular areas on this occasion briefly just to emphasise the importance of collective working, particularly between statutory and non-statutory services, just to ensure better outcomes for women in prostitution. And those are the areas of health and policing. Um, in terms of health, women affected by prostitution and trafficking frequently have very poor overall health. Uh, there's a strong correlation between women's uh, experience of being in prostitution, taking also with the factors that drew them in, and a decline in self-esteem, uh, emotional well-being, but the knock-on effect can also be a combination of uh, increased mental ill health, but also a neglect of physical health. And a key component to support women in prostitution is assistance and encouragement to look after their health. And so a combination of harm reduction, sexual, mental and practical general health services is critically important for women affected by prostitution to be able to access free and confidentially where possible. Um, Rahama is not a direct health service provider, but through our casework and our care planning with women, Supporting them to access health services is a key component um, and if desired, for instance, the caseworker will attend uh, and support a woman directly at critical points, for instance, if she's going to get test results that are causing great anxiety to her. But 
for our part, we rely on other health services and working generally with them. And to give an example, in 2012, we would have uh, advocated and engaged with uh, a number of services to access free uh, or affordable health care or emergency health interventions for women, including uh, GP services, for instance, within the Safety Net Initiative, drug projects offering clean needle, needle exchange and other support services, such as detox services, mental health services, including community mental health teams, medical social work services, and dedicated counselling services. Uh, Ruhama also offers counselling services uh, and holistic therapies in-house also. Uh, in particular, though, I would highlight our relationship with the dedicated HSE Women's Health Service, who provide a vital uh, holistic sexual health service to women in prostitution and to trafficking victims. It is a free and confidential service, and it's a critical element of any response to those in prostitution. Um, and we have a very positive engagement of mutual referral between those two services. Um, the connection between health advocacy and exiting supports is critical to try and maximise a system for women that will assist them throughout their experience of prostitution at all stages. Um, in the course of 2012, it's also great to note that this good practice is developing uh, in other parts of the country as well, particularly in Limerick, I'd highlight, where other services are increasing their collaboration to um, uh, offer both sexual health and broader supports to those uh, who are in that part of the country um, in prostitution on the ground. When it comes to responding to prostitution, um, especially in circumstances of organised prostitution and trafficking, and I suppose my emphasis now will be on policing, but I think it goes for all services that might come in contact with somebody who they suspect is vulnerable, who they suspect might be connected with the sex trade. There is a real need to resist taking things at face value. Um, things are not always as they seem. We're in a very positive position as an organisation because we work with women on the issue of prostitution, um, so it's on the table already. We work with them whether they're trafficked or not, whether they're connected with a pimp or not. That isn't the, um, the object of our service. And so what we note is that in some circumstances, uh, a woman that we've been supporting transpires to actually be a victim of trafficking or connected with a pimp or in some other more complex situation than we first realised. Um, that occurs because we've had a chance to build up a relationship of trust over time and trust is a really critical factor when you're engaging with anybody who has been betrayed uh, or exploited. So this of course is not always going to be a possibility for other stakeholders and so we would stress the need to look beyond the obvious uh, when engaging with a person in prostitution as they may be a potential victim whose plight could actually be quite easily overlooked um, indeed, we've actually had the situation of taking referrals from the DOCA Centre, which is the women's prison um, in Mount Joy, of women who've actually been incarcerated on convictions of brothel keeping, um, who turn out to be victims of trafficking themselves. Um, so awareness of the dynamics at play in the sex trade is something uh, that is really critical, in particular how criminally, heavily criminally organised it is, because the fact is those who are right at the coalface are the most vulnerable, um, and they're often understandably very reluctant to disclose anything that is going to um, connect them or lead uh, anyone to those who are actually criminally organising an operation. Um, Many uh, women are advertised as independent escorts on the websites, um, but our direct experience is that very, very few in the sex trade actually fit that bill, and the majority are connected with pimps, uh, and a proportion of those will also be trafficked. Um, but it is really important to note that this is something we think is increasingly being recognised by the Gardaí, and in particular there are some really positive measures that are being undertaken to focus uh, shift focus from those who are in prostitution as potential offenders to vulnerable persons who may even be trafficking victims. Uh, Ruham are very pleased to be one of the NGOs who uh, assist with the uh, in-service trafficking training for Gardaí, but we're particularly delighted to have engaged in a more focused piece of work, um, uh, training work in recent years with the direct support of National Services and the Dublin Metropolitan Gardaí Unit Quest who deal with organised prostitution. And this training is designed to complement the trafficking training by focusing on organised prostitution, uh, which, as I've noted, is the context for sex trafficking. Uh, the response from participants to this training has been really excellent. And while there are still situations we're finding where we regret to see women being criminalised, um, as service providers, we've noted an incremental shift in terms of the number of referrals to our own services from various Garda uh, Shiokona stations across the country where they are concerned about the women that they're engaging with rather than arresting and charging them with brothel keeping. 
Um, so this is something that we are really committed to uh, continuing and expanding in terms of this very positive partnership. A really important point, and I'm not going to speak for that much longer, I promise, uh, that I'd like to make in terms of responding to the issue of prostitution is the fact that, unfortunately, sometimes, even when everyone has done the right thing um, and responded using best practice, we can be confronted with a situation uh, that's really very hard to take and which has to lead us to broader reflection about the actions required to try to do the best that we can by women who find themselves in Ireland in the sex trade. Um, I'm going to give you an example of one case recently that I can tell you I personally know was really hard on our frontline staff team, but also very hard on the individual Gardaí involved. Um, we received a referral from the Gardaí of a young woman from Eastern Europe uh, she was in her late teens, and she immediately indicated when the Gardaí met with her that she had not been expecting to be in prostitution when she had travelled to Ireland, and she wanted to go home as soon as possible. Uh, we put her in emergency accommodation, and we were preparing to assist her with her voluntary return, um, but a suspicion arose uh, when she told us of how she came to arrive in Ireland that perhaps her own family might have knowingly been a party to her trafficking. And unfortunately, and tragically, this is what appeared to have happened because having been very distressed and determined to go home at one moment, directly following a phone call to her family in Eastern Europe, she came out of the room with a tight face and indicated, nope, it was okay, she was going to stay, she was going to go and work in prostitution, and that was that. Um, and basically this girl was left in a situation where the rug had been completely pulled from under her. And as a support service, we had no choice but to let her go. There was literally nothing we could do because she was constrained by a number of factors. Uh, her immigration status, she had permission to be in the state, but she didn't fulfill the habitual residency condition, and so she couldn't access any welfare benefits. She didn't speak any English, so she was not likely to be able to access the regular jobs market. And her family wanted the money and had effectively sold her into prostitution um, and directed her to return, so she couldn't go home. So all we could do was to try through her assigned caseworker to keep some connection with her and to ensure the knowledge on her part that if she felt she could get out and away in the future, uh, that we would be there to help as much as we can. And for the Gardaí, they'll now have to endeavour by a very different means of investigation to build a case against those exploiting her without her input. So prevention has to be the other critical component uh, of our response to prostitution and trafficking because the fact is sometimes when the damage is done it just can't be that easily repaired um, because Ireland is just too attractive and it is too lucrative uh, for those who are unscrupulously running the sex trade here. Um, a really particular challenge uh, is to overcome what are often systemic issues that are beyond the powers of one organisation. Uh, Therefore, a key pillar of Rahama's advocacy work is to uh, continue our awareness raising and advocacy work and taking direction from these experiences and the challenges that women present at the front line. We advocate on a number of fronts to try and improve Ireland's response to those exploited in the commercial sex trade and raise awareness of the challenges they face both in and when trying to exit. Uh, Rahama have made submissions and representations throughout 2012 on broad ranging issues including immigration policy, social welfare provisions and criminal justice. Um, and while we've advocated for updated legislation to enable the Gardaí to tackle the technological developments that pimps and traffickers are using to act without impunity, we also need to be looking at the source of demand. And for the sex trade and sex trafficking, we have a key driver of demand, and that is the sex buyer, who are a minority, again I'd stress a minority of men, who desire to use their own disposable income to buy sexual satisfaction in a manner that co causes untold misery. And studies show quite clearly that the majority of those who buy sex neither ask nor generally care to know the circumstances of the person that they're buying. So it's already been alluded to by uh, Deputy Corcoran Kennedy, but one aspect of our policy work which is truly a collaborative effort has been the very successful Turn Off the Red Light campaign uh, comprising now 68 organisations and which we're a core member of. In response to the campaign in 2012, um, it's already been outlined that there was a review of the legislation which we participated fully in and we are delighted to see the unanimous um, recommendation by the cross-party committee uh, following the, the extensive consultation to create an offence for the purchase of sex. Um, and we really believe that this measure 
can not only create a clear message that the purchase of another person's body is not acceptable, but also hit the organised crime that is effectively running the trade by striking at their customer base. Um, I want to take a moment, though, to note that a critical voice in this debate and the success of the campaign, which I think requires particular recognition, uh, is that of the extraordinary survivors who are increasingly coming forward and sharing their experiences and expertise on this issue. Um, we are very proud as a frontline organisation to be standing together now on platforms, in schools and indeed in parliaments, both here and internationally, to build a greater understanding of the harm of the commercial sex trade um, and to effect positive change. The voice of the survivor is loud and it is growing louder, but I think it's important to note that it is no small thing to advocate from personal experience on such a challenging issue. Um, so it's a real honour to know and collaborate with some of these exceptionally courageous and powerful women uh, and I'd acknowledge that some of them are with us today. So, to wrap up finally, <laughs> when responding to prostitution we really need to do it in a number of ways. Supports have to be provided uh, throughout a person's experience of being in prostitution and those of us in frontline services need to continue to collaborate directly. Uh, with, with women themselves to support their needs, which may include, but will not be restricted to the issue of prostitution. Um, but we also need to address it as a society and as a community to create structures that minimize the risk of entry into prostitution, uh, that recognize the inequalities at play, uh, and to challenge the sense of entitlement on the part of a small number of men to buy sex. And here, we also critically need to educate from the youngest child to the oldest person just about the fundamental harms of prostitution to all of society. Um, as the CEO of Ruhama, I would also like to take the opportunity today in wrapping up to acknowledge that our own work on this issue, uh, both frontline and advocacy, is made possible because of the great solidarity with the work from a number of key quarters. Uh, as the economic climate worsens and we see demand for support increase, it becomes a highly critical time with services really hanging in the balance. And Rahama is exceptionally thankful to the generosity and support of our donors without, without whom we could not survive. Um, and the relationship with our statutory funders is very important to us and hope um, very much that they'll continue to recognise and value Rahama's work. Internally, though, we have a highly motivated and dedicated staff and volunteer team, including our voluntary board of directors, and I'd like to express my own personal thanks to every person for their time, energy, enthusiasm, uh, and expertise, which sustains our work uh, through good times and bad. Um, and as an organisation, we're really grateful uh, to those who assist our work through uh, small, quiet ways through experts in IT, communications, and other individual acts of support and kindness which continue to surprise and touch us. Um, but my final word uh, must, of course, go to the women with whom we engaged through our services in 2012. Um, and despite some terrible hardships and adversity, there are also amazing tales of tenacity, uh, bravery, and creativity uh, from women whom, for me, it is an absolute privilege to know. So thank you for your time.